Our presenter today is Char Miller. Char is the W.M. Keck Professor of Environmental Analysis and History at Pomona College in California. He is a prolific author. Uh, probably he'll have two more books out by the end of this presentation, is my guess. Um, in August. <laughs> just, on, just in August, okay. Uh, one of his more recent books, uh, which I found to be an extraordinary accomplishment, Char, I have to say, uh, your document reader on Hetch Hetchy. Um, it, it's absolutely uh, a, an impressive work that you, you assembled there. I wish I were teaching so I could use it in the classroom. Blast to teach. What's that? It's a blast to teach. I bet. I yeah. bet. Um, and he has, as he mentioned in August, a book coming out called West Side Rising, How San Antonio's 1921 Flood Devastated a City and Sparked a Latino Environmental Justice Movement. I'm also happy to say he's a frequent contributor to Forest History Today, and he is also an FHS fellow, and that's in recognition of his long service both to the field of forest history and to the Forest History Society itself. And uh, thank you for presenting. Again, one, folks wanting to ask questions, please do that in the Q&A forum. Great, well, thank you, Jamie, so much. And um, thank you to Jamie and to the staff at FHS, Steve Anderson and, and Laura and Lauren and Evan. Uh, like any work in progress, it's in progress. Uh, and so what you're gonna get is, um, um, some of what I've been thinking about and try to compress it as quickly as I can, um, because this is a big issue. Um, but I want to start with the concept of fire suppression um, and issues that have emerged around it over the years. Uh, but mostly I want to start to talk about the question of fire suppression and a century of fire suppression that we hear about nonstop um, over the years as the root cause of the wildfires that have been ripping through um, the U.S. West and other places in the United States, to be sure, and around the world. It's in professional journals and media blogs and the like. Um, but it comes with, for me at least, a really crucial caveat. On the one hand, it's too long of a claim, and that the book will explore at some length, because it's really not until the post-World War II era, with all of the bulldozers and airplanes and other technology that comes in that the Forest Service and other agencies who have been fighting fire um, actually have the tools, let alone the, the material and the human beings and the finances to actually conduct the kind of fire suppression that they had been long talking about but had not been able to achieve. So on the one hand, it's, it's too short of a concept. On the other hand, a century of suppression actually is paradoxically um, 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 to not long enough. For those of us who live in California, and I'll be talking about that, that becomes quite clear in a variety of ways that, that I want to address. But, but to sort of begin this process, um, I want to help us understand um, why that story is um, not long enough, because in fact, it's really 200 plus year old process of fire suppression. And one of the ways to begin to think about that is to pick up on a, a letter that the Min Mission Indian Federation sent to President Coolidge in 1924 in the midst of and in the aftershocks of a series of pretty bad fire seasons in the San Gabriel and San Bernardino Mountains. Um, so bad was the fire season that Greeley came out twice by train to I have to say micromanage on the ground, uh, leading him at one point to fire the forest supervisor on the Angeles for not doing the job that Greeley thought he should have done. So that's context one of this letter, a letter that we I have not been able to locate yet through uh, the National Archives because I can't get in there, um, but which was reported in the California District Newsletter, which district was the earlier version of region. Um, in which there was a commentary about the president of this mission of the Federation writing Coolidge suggesting that the control of the national forest be returned uh, to uh, the indigenous people of Southern California. That letter went from Coolidge to the Secretary of Agriculture to the assistant or the acting Secretary of Ag um, and then ultimately went down, my bet is, to the Forest Service, which wrote the reply, a reply that indicated uh, intriguingly that um, no, this is not going to happen. Um, but if, if Native peoples would like to join the Forest Service in its conception of fire management, they 
doubtless would qualify. Actually, that doubtless is in doubt. But nonetheless, uh, what we're seeing here and the context of this letter is really crucial. The first of which is that fire season. The second of which is that in this second paragraph of this um, response, we see that there's not only a challenge to the effectiveness of indigenous people's use of fire in the past, but an argument that expertise only lay in one form of science and behavior and management, and that was in the hands of the US Forest Service. We'll see more of this as, as time goes on. But I also want you to draw your attention to the Mission Indian Federation's motto, human rights and home rule, because that goes directly to the larger issue of how long fire suppression had been a key element by which you take away the human rights and the capacity of native peoples in California to rule themselves. And there is a direct connection between those rights and that rule and fire suppression in the Golden State. So one of the ways of thinking about this is to recognize um, three waves of settler colonial disruption in the state of California or what would become called the state of California. The first beginning with the Franciscan missionaries, uh, Fray Juan Crespi, um, among many others who traveled the full extent of the coast and many of its inland valleys in the middle part of the 18th century. This is one of many quotes. If you follow Crespi on his way north up to San Francisco, almost every single day, he notes the use of fire by indigenous people from the Kumaya in what's now San Diego, all the way up to the Ohlone people of the Bay Area and the northern part of that coastal system from Monterey stretching north into San Francisco. Indeed, between Santa Cruz um, and uh, the San Francisco area, he can, you can count there's 17 incidents of fire that he witnessed on what today is like, a, you know, an hour and a half drive on a good day anyway. So what he was also noticing was how fire was used. As you can see here in this um, quote, one of many in which he speaks similarly, the use of fire basically to produce grasses, grasses that provided an enormous amount of food um, for the indigenous people from Southern, with Southern California up to uh, the central part of the state. Grass that grew so tall it topped us on horseback by a yard, he says, but note some spots were burned and others were not, telling us something about the capacity of indigenous people not only to burn land, but to burn it in a way that man that as a tool to produce the foods or some of the foods that they desired. To suppress fire, which Crespi and others uh, proposed, was bound up with the desire to control the people who used fire. The language here in a proclamation um, by the acting governor, Jose Arriaga, um, in uh, 1793, tells us something about the way in which the burning of fire, the childness of, of, of those who use those fires, led him to um, try to prohibit as best he could, not only in the towns, but also in the remote mountains. Um, because it is, as he said, necessary to uproot this very harmful practice of setting fire to pasture land. If you set fire, you don't need the Spanish because you have access to food. And another missionary pointed this out by saying their job was, quote, to denaturalize the Indians of California, take away their capacity to sustain themselves and compel them to live under Spanish rule, so you suppress fire to oppress the people. A calculation that Mexico would also produce um, when it gained control of what it called Alta California in the 1820s. Uh, and one of the ways it did it was through land and the exchange of land. So it broke apart the missions, which meant that the, those indigenous people who had in fact converted and lived and worked on the mission lands now are uprooted a second time. The ranchos might have hired them to work on their ranches, but they are no longer act, have very little access to land themselves. And as you can see from this map, those ranchos, once the Americans arrive in the 1840s and 1850s, would then be bought out, carved up. And you can see Los Angeles on the upper left, that sort of um, hatch mark up there. You can see other property rights 
emerging. And what you're also therefore seeing is another method by which you finish off indigenous rights to the land, uh, to the tool of fire um, that utilized, that they had utilized to manage these landscapes. Um, and the third and, and, and final way, uh, with the arrival of Americans, um, white Americans coming in, had to do with genocide. Uh, Jamie was kind enough to mention the Hachechi book that came out in um, last year with Broadview Press, uh, a reader that I put together about Hachechi and the Yosemite uh, that explored a lot of the um, genocides that occurred in the Central Sierra. But if you pull back out and you start to see this in relationship to what the Spanish and the Mexican states did, you begin to recognize the larger pattern, which in, to a degree, the population numbers seem to uh, reveal. In 1770, upper end estimate is about 350,000. Uh, by 1848, shortly after the gold rush, it was down by half. Um, and within 50 years, um, it had shrunk way further, uh, down to about 16,000. And how did this happen? Because in 1850, the state of California and its first governor basically put a bounty on the heads of indigenous peoples um, this is a um, illustration of a book that's called Saving the Settlers. That's hardly what this is about. It's about murdering Indian peoples, uh, which is why one of the best books about this process about California is titled Murder State. Uh, you can't get more blunt than that. And it's, 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 a, it's a book that's well worth reading because of the ways in which it articulates what's happening. But I would draw our attention not simply to the transformation of land ownership, not simply to the suppression of fire, though those two things are linked, and not simply, though crucially, to the decimation of the indigenous people of California, but that that produced a new kind of human geography, a new kind of land ownership. Um, in the case of the national parks in Yosemite, that's part of what's taking place here. Uh, John Muir can declare Yosemite wild a place that was absent of people, because in the 20 years before he got to the Central Sierra, those people who had been there were pushed out, murdered, uh, and driven into um, the margins of California, and that happened all over the state. The National Forests also get their creation on the basis of this dispossession. Um, as, as, as Ted Catton has pointed out um, in his award-winning book, American Indians and the National Forest, which came out five years ago. Um, the irony, he says, is inescapable. As the national forests are being created, the Indian estate is shrinking. Um, and so while through allotment issues and the like, Roosevelt um, began to shift lands away from um, tribal entities, whether treaty, ancestral, or homelands started to emerge, especially in the higher grounds. And you can see that here, whether it's the Southern California mountains, the Sierra, or the Cascades, and then the coastal ranges up in the Northwestern part of the state, all moved into the national forests. And it's that structure, this new ownership pattern that makes it possible for the Forest Service to begin to argue as they did in 1924 in reply to the Mission Indian Federation's letter, sorry, we now manage it. We manage it on the terms that we conceive of as being appropriate um, and your actions um, and your desires are, unless they fit within this management schema, uh, make no sense to us. But there is pushback, pushback coming from Stuart White but not Stuart White alone, as we will see. White, in a series of essays in Sunset Magazine, funded by the Southern Pacific Railroad that supported his arguments, begins to make a set of claims um, about what will be called light burning um, by those in support of it and Paiute forestry by those who are against it. That begins to raise the question about that very expertise that the Forest Service advocated in its letter to the Mission Indian Federation and which its um, writers internal to the agency um, published any place they could um, across the United States. So some of what, what White was arguing about then is to think about what it means to say that fire is bad. As he says, nevertheless, fire, a bad master, is an excellent servant. It depends upon how you use this biological agent. Um, there are good fires, he said, and bad fires. 
And so we have to know the difference of one and, and the degree to which it is different from the other. But what he's also talking about, which the Forest Service essentially denied, is that California was made by fire. Estimates are that 2% of California burned every year before the Spanish arrived. Estimates that are based on um, not only oral histories and traditions within Indian peoples, uh, but also on fire scar evidence um, throughout the Sierra, which the Forest Service was beginning to analyze and recognizing that that was the case. Um, White poses that question. He, the response of the Forest Service to White, uh, particularly in Sunset Magazine, but also in the Timberman as, as this piece is, is to decry his position by calling it a term that they coined, Paiute forestry. And here is where the Forest Service um, and those who advocate with it are dealing with a, a kind of racial rhetoric because it's, it's, it's um, probably the worst thing that a white person could tell an, another white person is that they were Indians and that they were operating like Indians. And so for the Forest Service to decry Paiute forestry suddenly plays into this larger story that has been taking place in California um, since the Spanish arrived in the 1760s. They may not know it, and in fact, they tend not to know that earlier history. But when, when Henry Graves, as chief of the Forest Service, announces in the timber map, um, and would also write in the Sunset Magazine that um, what the system of forest protection is, is being challenged by what he calls a cheap and easy method of touch them off and let them burn, which is exactly not what White was talking about. Um, nonetheless, it sets up this dynamic that would be replicated by his successor that same year, by William B. Greeley, who had been coming out in the night, who would be coming out in the 1920s to advocate even more strenuously for suppression of fires in the San Gabriel, San Bernardino, and Santa Ana Mountains. Uh, they weren't having a lot of luck, by the way, but nonetheless, he came out here to insist upon that process. He argues against the notion that light fire, what we would call prescribed fire, would keep the forest clean or cleaner anyway and that that would minimize serious conflagrations. Turns out that the suppression that he was advocating didn't do much to stop those conflagrations from coming. Um, but the third force uh, in this case was also Aldo Leopold in the same year, wrote a piece about Paiute forestry, um, what he called this light burning propaganda um, that would destroy the productiveness of the forest on which Western industries depend. And it's that point that's crucial. It isn't that they didn't think fire created these forests. What they want to stress um, is to get rid of fire meant that you would have a lot of timber that you could then sell, merchantable, um, in Leopold's word. And that's what sets up this new controversy, this set of arguments. Um, but again, Stuart White's argument, White was a novelist, um, uh, and a, um, a prolific essayist. Uh, he didn't just write about this, but many other things. But he honed in on what Leopold and Greeley and Graves and others were arguing and suggesting that the very notion of expertise was being, their notion of expertise was being threatened um, by the keys that he issued. The graduates of the four schools, and there's really um, Yale among them, uh, do not so represent uh, a body of expert opinion on these subjects as they imagine. Um, most scientists or experts have a contempt for laymen, but in this case, it is not justified. In short, White is arguing for an alternative reading of what was happening on the land and how one could manage that land um, to actually produce better results. But in the end, the Forest Service um, would be successful, and we know it's successful um, not only as a, as a, as a um, construct, as a paradigm, um, because of the external letter that it wrote in 1924 articulating why it needed to do what it needed to do, but also through internal um, assumptions that were being played out. Among those internal assumptions um, is, is, comes from a letter from Alan Kalbrick, who had, had worked up in Montana, who wrote to Gifford Pinchot in 1940, 
that in connection with fires, he was wondering if it isn't nature's way of cleaning up her backyard. She sent fire along and cleaned up the rubbish and gave a new stand, clean ground on which to grow. An argument, by the way, that Gifford Pinchot himself had made in the 1890s. Of course, Calbrick argues, I know a fellow probably would be shot if he advocated this, but you know, nature is a pretty wise old girl. And when man tries to improve on it, we generally get things wrong. Calbrook worked for his entire life in the US Forest Service and he understood the internal culture so he could talk after he had retired to the retired Gifford Pinchot about what was actually going on. But that tells us something about the internal psychology uh, the culture inside the agency is you do not buck against the system, even though you know the system is probably wrong. Ehlers Koch, who I was uh, fortunate enough in 2019 to annotate and introduce um, his biography, 40 Years a Forester, um, in 1935 made basically the same claim. After having fought fires for 35 years, he recognized that they were overfighting them, that there were places that should not um, and should have fire because it was the only way, in fact, to um, clean up, as Calbrick said, the forest and launch a new generation of trees. Um, when he submitted that article to the Journal of Forestry, which is the primary organ for foresters at that day, it was shut down. Finally, it was published, but only when there was an editorial at the beginning of the magazine critiquing his position. He was, he was bookended by two essays, one before and after, uh, which undercut his arguments. That tells you something about how uh, professional foresters wrapped themselves into this argument um, and tried to muffle any kind of critique um, in a way that expanded their own um, expertise um, and developed an argument in contrast. But in the end, things did shift. There was a paradigm shift. The shift began in the South. Uh, Steve Pine has written beautifully about this process. Uh, Ellen Call Long in 1888 uh, wrote a really interesting piece about forests in Florida in which she basically says the longleaf pine must have fire. You cannot suppress it because if you do, what you're going to get, as she says, a jungle of hardwood and deciduous trees. And it's the longleaf that was so not only iconic to Florida, but crucial to its industry. Her call for the continuation of flames in those landscapes uh, was not unlike that of H.H. H. Chapman, who was at Yale, um, who also bucked his professional peers beginning in 1912, so 40 years after uh, 30 years or so after Long wrote, um, begins to be, make the same kinds of arguments. In the 1960s, the Tall Timber um, Timbers um, Research um, Symposium in the South, and again, Stephen Pine has written beautifully about that sort of emergence of a new paradigm that's, that's taking place in the South. But what's so striking to me is that even as these arguments are slowly being made in the southern region of the Forest Service and in the state agencies, California was resistant. And I've been reading a number of essays written by foresters um, employed by the state of California in the Division of Forestry in the 60s and early 70s, basically saying, yeah, we, we know what they're doing in the South, but it is not going to happen here. It can't. We don't know enough. We don't know how to do it. Um, and, and we're not going to do it until we feel more comfortable doing so. That also tells us something about the hook, the hold, the stickiness of a paradigm over time. So how is it that we now have a indigenous peoples in collaboration with county, state, and federal foresters touching off fires? One way to think about it is the return of indigenous flames. Um, I would also suggest, and, and this is more suggestion to me than to anyone else, that they may never have left, that the fires were always there. Um, there were always fire managers um, that used fire to produce cultural materials. And Bill Tripp, uh, a member of the Karuk people in Northern California and the Department of Natural Resources, a longtime firefighter, tells this story um, of his great grandmother in the early 1970s, taking them outside when she was over 100 years, Bessie Tripp, uh, who was a sort of archetype uh, activist uh, for the Karuk people in the day, also taught her great-grandson how to start to manage with fire. 
a thing that she used repeatedly across her life to help make the baskets that she utilized um, in her day. Um, and Tripp, in, his, in many of his writings, talk about, talks about the fact that he grew up with fire in Northern California, that they were touching off to produce various kinds of goods, services, and um, ecosystemic um, developments. Um, and it wasn't until he left the kind of community that he began to realize that not everybody was doing this, that fire had been so much a part of his life and of, of his people's life. Um, but he's not alone. Um, Ron Good, uh, chairman of the North Fork Mono, Mono people in central um, the Sierra, since the 1990s has been collaborating with and in contention with uh, land management agencies at the county, state, and federal level to reintroduce fire in the Sierra, um, in the national forests in particular. As he said, I, he's basically been patient enough to wait for the forest region, that is region five, to come around to how he thinks. Um, but the fight is still ongoing. It is terribly frustrating, as he says, and Bill Tripp makes the same claim, that you have to constantly re-educate those um, who are in opposition to the work that, that he and others have been doing. Um, I wanna end with this quote from Michael Misquish uh, from the Kumeya Nation in, in, in San Diego. It was one of the first set of peoples that Crispy and Portola and other missionaries encountered. They encountered the Kumaya firing the landscape of, of that part of Southern California to do as their peers were doing all the way up the central coast and the inland valleys. And what Misquish in a talk given to the Pomona College Humanities Studio in the fall um, talked about was how to return good fire to the land. Far more difficult in Southern California with 20 million people than it might be for the Koruk, Hupa, um, and others in Northern California, which is a much smaller population base. But to do so, he said, is to understand what fire meant to his people, that it was in fact embedded in a greeting that you give to those whom you first meet. Fire, as he says, is at once spiritual and physical, biological and personal, uh, cosmological force. It destroys and purifies, it, re -bring, it bring, brings new birth. Um, and in a way for him, and he's been practicing this since the 1990s when he established an environmental protection um, agency internal to the Kumeya Nation to use fire to not only bring back certain kinds of cultural resources, but also to restore watersheds and, and indigenous plants uh, that were central to his people and have long been central to his people. His advocacy, it seems to me, points to um, another set of arguments and a returning of the loop, it, it seems to me, that is really critical to this process. Because the very mountains that he is beginning to experiment with, the San Gabriel, the Santa Anas, uh, the San Jacintos, uh, and the San Gabriels, that was the landscape that the Mission Indian Federation a century ago wrote to Calvin Coolidge and said, you need to return it to us because we know how to better steward these landscapes than clearly you do. That seems to me to be a really crucial way of helping us understand the longer term, the longer history that dates back to Crespi and others um, in the mid 18th century. Um, good fire, it seems to me, and it's language that Ron Good uses and Bill Tripp uses, good fire may help us get out of these bad fires. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Char. Um, we're going to start taking questions. Again, please use the, the Q&A forum, not the chat uh, forum for those. And um, we have Jonathan Gerlin, who asks, or he notes that uh, Austin Carey, who was a contemporary of Pinchot and of H.H. Uh, Chapman, so early 20th century forester, also advocated the use of ecological fire in the U.S. South. And Jonathan wants to know if Austin Carey had a relationship with Aldo Leopold, especially during the 1920s. Do, do you know of any I correspondence or interaction? With don't. Uh, that's a really interesting question um, because essentially what you're asking is, 
when did that knowledge that the Southern foresters are starting to develop make its way west? Um, and it's, it, I don't know the answer to that, although one of the essays that will be in the reader that I'm developing um, is from a member of uh, a firefighter and fire manager um, who writes about Georgia and California. And you can see in that process a kind of transition. And this is in the mid 19, late 1950s. Um, where he thinks that what he has learned in Georgia might actually work really well in California, uh, except when you start to work for the California Division of Forestry, you find out there is a lot of resistance in there. So if there was a kind of transmission of knowledge between Kerry and Leopold, um, and Steve Pine is on the call, um, and my bet is if anybody on the planet knows, Steve does, um, and I would defer to him. Well, as it turns out, we have the leading Aldo Leopold biographer online. Oh, good. Kurt's on. Kurt yeah. Miney uh, yeah. chimed in to say that, yes, they did know one another. Um, and, and perhaps at a, a later time, we can have Kurt on to discuss uh, some connections like that. Yeah, good. But that's a really, that was a great question, Jonathan. And not surprising the world of forestry being so small then, and uh, especially when you're in the, you're in the smaller group, i.e. the outcasts. Right. The heretics, uh, yeah, I'm not, not surprised they were communicating. Uh, Ralph Lutz wants to know, he, he recognizes that this is a work in progress, and he mm -hmm. is wondering if you have an idea of when this work might be published. Uh, well, thanks, Ralph, a lot. Uh, no pressure. Um, yeah, my goal is to finish the manuscript um, this summer, and so that would mean in a year. Um, as you won't be surprised to know that it got an enormous boost this past summer as California experienced five of the six largest wildfires in its history. Uh, and it wasn't what sparked my interest in the subject, um, but I knew I was going into the humanities studio thinking about indigeneity. Um, and I knew not a lot about indigenous fires, but, but it, it certainly... Um, the contemporary wildfire scene in, in the West, uh, and we're looking at potentially a really horrible year again this year because of, of a two-year drought now that is gripping this region. Um, you know, I feel a, a responsibility to get this done quickly, but perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening. Uh, Marion Petzinelli Dubay. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name, Marianne. Um, she wants you to clarify, and she's at uh, SUNY ESF, the environmental uh -huh. school yep, yep, yep. there at SUNY, um, Syracuse, That's I believe. Cool. Uh, she wants to, she asks if you would clarify once more what constitutes bad fire. And, and, and I'd, I'll let you run with that. I, I know there's the different ways of doing, it, defining it. Well, I'll tell you what, Michael Misquish described as bad fire and, and Ron Good also. I was on a uh, Autry Museum conversation with him. Um, and it was interesting to me that they used exactly the same terms um, to, to describe both the good and the bad. Um, a good fire for, for Michael um, was one that produces certain kinds of cultural resources predetermined. Um, so one of the things that they've been very effective on their very small campo uh, a reservation um, in eastern San Diego County um, is to restore watersheds um, and riparian wetlands um, because A, one, it's ecologically an important thing to do, and B, because of the um, cultural material that those wetlands also produce for uh, the Kumaya. Um, he would argue that that's a good fire. It's well-intentioned and you understand the, the ecological and, and, and uh, social things that, that come from that uh, for all species, not just his own. A bad fire, he would argue, um, and we haven't seen one like this. Well, actually we did last summer, uh, not unlike the Bobcat fire, which incinerated 150, almost 200,000 acres in the San Gabriels um, that came and burned through areas that had burned before. And so the problem for Chaparral is the return cycle is 15 to 30 years. You burn it more intensely than that and more uh, consistently than that, and you produce grass. 
that's not a good fire if you're thinking about indigenous landscapes um, because you have just converted it. Um, and so, and Ron Good talks very similarly about the central Sierra that the, the monster fires um, that have occurred over the last couple of years um, are converting those spaces in ways that are, pro, you know, do not necessarily align with um, the goals of the North Fork Mono and other peoples. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking for them, but, but you know, I, which is complicated, um, but that is how they've described what for them is good and what for them is not good. Okay. And just so you know, and I'm, I am looking at uh, 14 questions. So um, keep them coming. You can plan accordingly. All right. Um, Patricia McCormick says up in Alberta, uh, she had proposed to a group of park officials that Albertans should consider a class action suit with relation to the terrible fires that swept through Slave Lake and Fort McMurray. The, ba the basis for the suit would be that they were the direct result of fire suppression programs. She's wondering if there's any legal action of this kind happening elsewhere. Ooh, that's good. I have no idea. Um, I think the complicating factor in all of this is, and why I, um, you know, fire suppression has a role to play. Uh, climate change has, a, has in many respects um, drought and the like at least in the US Southwest, um, a huge role to play in this process also. Um, but again, I would defer to those who are more familiar with the legal situations. I, I you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine um, how, I mean, it, lawsuits happen, right? It's hard to imagine how that one would succeed, but, but then I'm not a lawyer. You can, yeah, there's a difference between filing the lawsuit and winning the lawsuit. Yes. And fighting the government is going to be quite challenging. Yeah. Um, Pete Irvine wants to know if, or asks if you could speak to Smokey Bear and the, the line, change in language from preventing forest fires to preventing wildfires. Oh, what an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, Smokey Bear is um, an intriguing symbol for the, for the Forest Service and really for fire, you know, wildland firefighting at state and local levels too. Um, I think the way the language has shifted is not just about Smokey Bear, it's also um, um, how reporters report, how the sort of broader conversation has shifted um, to something called wildfire, um, which, and, and, you know, I learned this from Steve Pine, uh, so I'm going to blame him. But much of these fires, in fact, certainly in California, have way less to do with wildness than they do with structural fires. That is to say, we, what, 36 million Americans have moved into wildland urban interfaces over the last 30 years, and they've brought fire with them. So I actually think, I mean, my own sense is that, that, um, we're fire bringers. We bring the torch with us. And, and in, in California, at least, it's about utilities since their substations fail and all of a sudden we get, you know, 200,000 acres on fire. Um, but, but I, I, you know, the cultural significance of saying forest fire as opposed to wildfire, um, at least in Southern California, we have very different kind of forests than one imagines a forest to look like. And that's also part of the problem in, in nomenclature. Ours are chaparral fires. Um, and chaparral is an extraordinary plant, um, but it doesn't look like a tree. And I think some of this is to give a broader interpretation um, to the very fact of fire, 80% uh, of our mountains here are chaparral, and it's one of the dominant species across the state. So I, I and I'm guessing here, and again, Steve Pine can chime in because Steve knows, um, but my guess is that we're looking at a sea change in language that is trying to be more inclusive of all kinds of fires as opposed to simply sequoia, pine, whatever it might be. That's my recollection from from reading Pine and others is, I think it was in the early to mid nineties, that language changed. It was in recognition of it's not just forests that are burning, as you said, mm 
but also uh, trying to ease the public off the subject of all fire is bad. Right. To right. An, an understanding of, you know, controlled fire good, wildfire bad. Um, it's probably such a subtle shift and they've done such an outstanding job of drumming prevent forest fires into our heads. It, it's it's going to be gener a couple of generations, I think, probably. before that changes. Right. And it's actually, I mean, that in itself is something that both Michael Misquish and Ron Good and Bill Tripp have all written about, um, is that even as they have started up with indigenous fire, um, they don't think they're going to live, be alive. I mean, that this is a cross-generational process, right? You, you have 100 plus years of one rhetoric um, and you're not going to burn it out within a, within a generation. It's going to take time for us to begin to reorient um, how we speak about fire. Uh, and from my mind, one of the keys is how we speak about development. Um, this book isn't going to really touch on that necessarily, but um, the suburbanization of the wildlands um, that Lincoln Bramwell and others have written about as of I, um, that's posing dilemmas that no one back in the day, Gifford Pinchot, Austin Carey, Aldo Leopold, none of them could have foreseen exactly what was happening or would happen at the end of the century in which they boosted this uh, process. Um, and, and that to me is, um, you know, it's astonishing when 150,000 people come flying out of the Sierra and you thought it was empty. Yeah, it depends on how you define humans. Um, <laughs> so um, we have an anonymous uh, attendee who asks, um, it seems that the government is starting to place a higher priority on tribal consultation on resource management and conservation issues. Do you think if this re relationship improves, the Forest Service, and I assume federal, not state, Forest Service may adopt more indigenous fire management practices. Yeah, I think that's already happening, actually. Um, and again, Ron Good in his conversation at the Autry Museum, among other places, um, has indicated that, that to his mind, a lot of this is happening. Um, if I have this right, no, I didn't, I didn't quote it. Um, there's a I don't know if it's Frank Lane. There are a number of um, forest researchers associated with uh, the Forest Service who are indigenous themselves um, and have been really active in the research end of this process that then starts to move its way into policy. Um, and, you know, I think there's, there's, um, there's hope in that regard. And I think it's, um, Intriguing that in the one state where much of the argument about light burning emerged most forcefully um, is now finding itself with, with an, a new emerging paradigm um, that is trying to create an alternative, an alternative that is actually historically based. Okay. Um... Well, we've been uh, mentioning Steve Pine throughout, <laughs> and uh, he has uh, weighed in a little bit here. And Good. First of all, he wants to congratulate you on the wonderful presentation. Uh, but his comment is, it's worth noting that forestry emerged in a temperate Europe, an anomalous place that lacks natural fire and considered fire simply as a matter of social behavior. Europe's elites treated peasants' traditional use of fire with the same disdain they did indigenes in Europe's imperium. Yep. Even Linnaeus was forced to delete favorable passages about fire from an official report in about 1750. So this is a long standing, this is a long running battle. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but he finishes by saying, in fact, we have no science of landscape fire until maybe the 1990s. So within our lifetimes. Yes. Um, I, I, I share the comment. If you wish to, to respond, I will uh, yield my time <laughs> to the gentleman from California. Absolutely. Uh, no, I think Steve is absolutely right. And I think that's, that's um, it's become 
clear to me that um, uh, as, as you build a paradigm, as, as Graves and Greeley and to, in his own regard, Gifford Pinchot did, um, you then get to ask, well, what do they know? Like, what's the basis of the knowledge that they advance? Um, and, you know, there's, there's this wonderful piece that Pinchot wrote in 1898 that will be in the book uh, for the National Geographic, um, in which he does a superb job identifying the ecological role that fire plays in three different forced systems. The last sentence of which is, but none of this matters in the politics of fire. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's essentially what he says is like, yes, I just wrote 10,000 words or 5,000 words or whatever it was in the National Geographic. But by, so you know, this doesn't matter in terms of our need to fight fires. And you've got it right there, right? He understood as best he could identify in 1898 what, what fire's ecological purpose was. But there was a political structure that he was also beholden to and is manifesting. Um, and as Steve says, you know, we didn't have a landscape concept of fire until the 1990s, uh, in part, I would argue, because we created an administrative state of which the Forest Service is one of the prime entities um, that, that um, said that expertise lay within this construct. Um, in this agency and these people who had been trained at Yale, most of them, many of them at least, um, some at Duke and other places that started to have, an, and indeed um, ESF at, at SUNY um, that, that emerged to sort of manage fire based on what they had learned. And as Stuart White said, you know, they think they're experts, but there's an alternative set of arguments and he's not even referring to indigenous management. He's talking about ranchers and, and um, farmers and people like himself who owned a lot of property and used um, prescribed fire to manage it. Terry Sherrick, who's at Michigan Tech says, I hear you using the word indigeneity. Yeah, mm -hmm. indigeneity. How might you define this and how does it differ from the term indigenuity? Which I, is, don't, I don't know indigenuity. That's an interesting concept. Hold on, I got to write that one down. <laughs> well, she, Terry says uh, it's from Daniel. Whoop, where'd that question go? <laughs> Sorry, the, the, the questions are coming in and then they move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and it gets slipped down. Yeah. So indigenuity comes from the work of Daniel Wildcat and others. Um, Terry understands it to be about the application of deep spatial indigenous knowledge to problem solving. The latter term would seem to be central to your thesis. So I guess yeah. it's a recommendation to- uh, Yeah, great, thank you. Absolutely, it's very helpful. It's a system of knowledge effectively, right? And so um, indigeneity really probably in that construct would refer to people and indigenuity would be the things they know. Is that a fair reading? We'll find out. Yeah. No, Terry, thank, thank you very Daniel much. Uh, no, that's great. Thank you. I feel both uh, 10 points smarter and 30 points dumber simultaneously. Yeah. <laughs> it's a day. It's, it's a like, day. That's it's it's every day. Um, Aranzazu. Uh, I, I apologize, uh, wants to know if ecologists are now talking about ecological transformation due to persistent large fires year after year. Did this exist in the past? And I, I am unsure if they're asking if ecological transformation took place or did ecologists talk about ecological transformation in the past? I leave it up to you to you can answer either question. Well, if you if you think about what um, Ellen Call Long talked about, she said if you snuff out fire, you're going to change the landscape in Florida. And she grew up in and around Tallahassee um, in the in the Panhandle, and said, you know, you take out fire, you take out um, the longleaf, and you it gets converted to something else. Um, Forest Service 
researchers around the country, um, currently anyway, are, are, are studying exactly that kind of transformation in terms of um, uh, forests or chaparral that are starting to get converted to grassland um, as a consequence of big fires, but also climate change and how one disentangles those two sets of factors, um, and maybe, in fact, you probably can't, um, is, is revelatory, um, because if you burn out a forest and the Southwest, which has been drying out since the 1980s, can no longer sustain that pine cone that has fallen down and, and, and sort of flourishes, you've got serious issues, serious transformation. How far back in the past, I, uh, you know, I think um, there's probably very good work in the, in the, in, in, um, again, in the US experience in the South with those issues. Um, you know, we've already seen how badly managed landscapes um, can transform radically. Um, the Dust Bowl and places like that is, are examples of it. Um, I just don't know the science deep enough in the past to know whether either the scientist understood it or whether it was uh, referred through oral traditions and other mechanisms. Rick Zen is, uh, asks if you know the origin of the term peyote um, forestry. Well, the only place I've seen it in Graves, Greeley, and Leopold. Um, I'm, that's actually one of the things I'm looking for to see if anyone who is supporting what they describe as light burning also uses that language. Um, I haven't found it yet. I've gone through probably 80 plus articles in, in um, again, you can only go where the digital is enabling me to go at this point. Um, Steve might know better. Uh, David Carl, who is another one who's written extensively about light burning. I've got a call in him actually to say uh, origins, but, but my read of it at this moment, again, work in progress, caveats all included, um, is that it is a forest service uh, term. Hmm. And, and wielded like a weapon. Totally uh, weaponized. Yeah. David Nunez says, I see an interesting parallel today with the increasing recognition of the release of atmospheric carbon from fires in the West to the role of, quote unquote, protecting merchantable timber in the early 20th century. How do you see this recognition of carbon release from fires impacting the potential role of the greater use of fire going forward? <laughs> yeah, so that's a huge issue, is it not? Especially in, I mean, in the state of California, and California is just exemplifying um, Utah and Arizona and elsewhere. Um, it gets, boy, does this get complicated. Um, and, and the sort of calculations, at least, again, those that I've been able to read, um, is makes that very complicated because in fact, at the moment, we're not, it doesn't seem as if there's a consensus about um, that, that release and how, how uh, dramatic it is. Though I have to say, you just watch smoke particles make their way across from the Sierra mountains to Europe and you get a sense of that these fires are global in their reach if even though ignited locally. Um, and, it, and it does seem to me that that's, that's part of the play, right? Is that you um, need to figure out how to um, manage that rapid explosive release of carbon on the one hand, um, which is not always forests. Do keep in mind in Southern California and parts of this state, what you're also burning are houses, uh, large numbers of them, structures anyway, let's call them structures. Um, and I have to say that um, Javier Becerra, who, as attorney general for the state of California, just before he went into the Biden administration, uh, intervened in a lawsuit joining uh, environmental groups in Lake County, which has burned probably once every two years in the last decade. I mean, it has been torched continuously. The county commissioners agreed to a massive development um, and sort of rubber stamped an, uh, an, an environmental uh, impact report that 
the state said, this, this is a violation of every climate change regulation that we have. And that's why Becerra intervened. It's the first time that the state has stopped, at least as far as we know, a development. Why? Because it's not just the miles driven from Lake County to wherever work is, it's the structures themselves that are going to release enormous amounts of carbon. So again, it's not just what we call wildfires. These are structure fires that are been erupting um, and that are produced by you know, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, Southern Cal Edison, who have been really reticent to pour any money into upgrading their facilities uh, that spark these fires. And almost every single one of them, um, of late at least, has been a utility fire, which is also implicated then in the suburbanization of these, what we used to think of as wildland uh, urban interfaces. And for me, it's their fire zones. Let's call them what they are. Ted Stubblefield, who's a retired Forest Service forest mm -hmm. supervisor uh, along these lines, he's, he asks, is managed wildfire, and he has that in quotes, yep. justified when approximately uh, 15,000 citizens die each year from smoke inhalation? That's as I understand a US figure, he has a, a different figure that might be a global one. So anyway, the question is, how, how is managed wildfire justified when smoke inhalation and, the, and, the, and all of that is killing or contributing to the deaths of tens of thousands? Well, as someone who lives in Los Angeles and who breathes all sorts of things in the air, uh, and there's a lot more people who die as a result of, of vehicle emissions than those who die from smoke. Um, you know, my joke last year was I couldn't wait to start breathing automobile emissions again, um, which is not a joke, it's pretty macabre. Um, I, would, I would say that managed fire, and let's use your concept, produces less smoke. Then the campfire produces hmm. less smoke than the bobcat, produces less <laughs> than all of the complex fires that erupted last year uh, and burned 14 mil 4 million acres in the state of California and nearly a million in Oregon and a million in Washington. Um, that strikes me as far more complicating uh, for one's lungs, more compromising of one's lungs than prescribed burns um, used as targeted and, and um, um, because I do not think, and the state of California is really advocating this, I think large-scale prescribed fires, that's the question. Uh, that strikes me as um, more troublesome than thinking in ways that Bill Tripp and others do, which is these are targeted fires that are doing particular kinds of things that over generations might in fact reduce this process. Uh, every state and California is one of them, wants a quick fix. There is no quick fix to this. Steve Pine has made that very clear. <laughs> Sorry again to throw this on you, Stephen, but you know, that, that's what I've learned from you, right? This is not going to be an easy thing to resolve. If we've just gotten the science of fire and landscapes beginning in the 90s, um, you know, we're not there yet. But, but reducing the kind of, as best one can, the amount of atmospheric release of carbon that, um, I mean, pick your big fire in the last decade. I mean, 14 of the 16 largest fires in California, modern history at least, that we know of, uh, have, appeared, have occurred since 2003. That strikes me as a smoke signal of many kinds um, and that really requires us to think um, in ways that allows us to more manage fire um, rather than to do less of it. Okay. Caroline Torkeldson asks, how are things today? Are we learning and modifying what we do to better manage fire or is it worse? Uh, it depends on the site. Um, and here's where, again, let me use California as an example. Um, if you're sitting in Southern California as I am, there's one set of management that has to happen. There's more than 20 plus million people who live in this area. Um, the mountains are fire adapted, but there's way too many people living in areas that are going to burn. And you know, ultimately um, you fight it in a particular way. 
Um, in Northern California, and I don't mean the Bay Area, but I mean far Northern tier up in Shasta, Tahama County, um, you know, in that sort of Northern ring where the population is less, there are different strategies that you can employ. It's what Ehlers Koch mentioned in 1935, which is that, you know, the Lolo uh, back then had almost no one near it. And so you could have managed fire in a different way than he felt that he and his peers had been doing um, since 1900. And he, you know, he, he acknowledged his own complicity in that process and suggested that we could do this in different ways. Calbrick's comment in the 1940s that he saw in fire a capacity to manage forests um, and produce better results than simply going in and putting out everything. So we know that that plus indigenous traditional histories, um, oral histories and, and contemporary management practices um, helps us see alternative routes that we could take. Um, and I think that's, that's what's being discussed, right? That this is, this is where we are now. Um, and, you know, for, for uh, Bill Tripp, who collaborates extensively with the Forest Service, in part because members of his community are in the Forest Service, um, you know, there, that for me is a hopeful sign. And it, that it's taking place in the North is not surprising because it's a different fire regime with a different set of ecosystems. And I guess my larger answer would be, it depends on the ecosystem and how it comes and how one goes about treating fire and utilizing fire. Um, and, you know, it's, if we're going to think ecosystemically, then that requires us to think more targeted and more micro and more logically around habitats for structure um, and the like. Okay. Several people bring up Harold Biswell, who was a uh -huh. yeah. forestry professor at UC Berkeley, started there, uh, I think, in the 1940s. So I'm going to combine questions about. Sure about him, um, did first, did he influence Starker Leopold in his drafting of the Leopold Report uh, for the National Park Service and its call for more introduction of fire in the Sierras? You know, it wouldn't surprise me. And again, I would defer to those who've, um, I mean, it, you know, I'm thinking about putting a, a portion of that report in. It actually doesn't say a lot. It's a really interesting report that doesn't actually say as much as it's uh, reputed to have said. Um, and, um, you know, I think part of what, what um, those are the kinds of connections I'm looking for, right? To see how these sort of cultural transmissions, these, uh, these um, technological transfers at some level um, emerged. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a very different kind of, um, process, but I think ultimately it's one that, that helps us see who read what and what happened. Um, and Biswell is one of, one of the story, one of the people in this book, because he did write um, extensively about, about the need to do this and also re read between the lines, you can see the hurdles that he's trying to overcome. Yeah, and for those Inside his own forced school. Yeah, and inside those, the state force system. For those not familiar with him, he was a strong proponent of light burning, and he was like so many others we've spoken about. Ellers Koch uh, being an example, he he was considered heretical. Um, yeah. So another question was, and again, uh, Biswell's 1940s to 1960s, somewhere in there. Did he have any contemporaries uh, advocating for the use of light burning? or um, as Jan Byers asks, Indian style burning in Southern California at the same time. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, you know, uh, I haven't encountered it. And I think part of what, what Biswell, um, why I think he's important, <laughs> in part because he is alone, right? He's one of those folks who understood it and had done some work in, in the South. And so he's one of the sort of links that, that bring, this, bring this story forward. Um, outside of um, 
the Mission Indian Federation's claim in the 20s and the work that the Kumeya and Michael Misquish launched in the 1990s, early 1990s. Um, there's, you know, I'd have to go look at the, um, the fire lab in the river, what's now called the Riverside Fire Lab, uh, which is a US Forest Service Southwest research um, entity um, to see, um, but I haven't, I haven't run into it, you know, if you, and, and where you would, one of the ways that you, that I've been sort of doing this is thank God I have access to the digital archives of the LA Times, which has been following fire like crazy uh, since the late 19th century. And, and um, that's how I know William B. Greeley kept coming out here and firing people and saying, you're not doing the job I would have done. It's like, good God, man, let them do their work. Um, is that it's been surfacing only recently these kinds of discussions. Um, and so, but that's a great question and I, I, will, I will dig around. Terry Hyman wants, asks, how do we make the general public more aware of the differences between good fire and bad fire? And how do we effectively advocate the use of controlled fire? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I would, I would say that um, like everything, it requires participating in local governments, um, operating in ways that um, may be quite local. I mean, it's one of the things I do here in Claremont is um, we're, we're constantly advocating for and the city and its philanthropic partners have been moving in this regard. And I'm late on this story, but you know, it, um, it's been an interesting way to watch how a small town starts buying up foothills uh, for open space, but also now fire protection is part of the mix. Um, and we're, we're trying to <laughs> We're trying to raise $7 million to buy a mere 100 acres. Keep in mind that this is going to be an expensive process. Um, but, but for the first time, the argument is, look at the fires, look at the places that burn. This is a place that has burned in 2003 at the last time. Um, and roughly every 20 or so years after that, prior to that. Um, so some of this is about working within the communities that you live to sort of articulate it that way. Some of which is in CAL FIRE, which is a pretty extraordinary uh, fire suppression agency also has the capacity and does really good jobs with educating people about defensible space. And, and if you're gonna live in the Santa Monica mountains, which you shouldn't do, nonetheless, if you do, here are things that the steps that you can take should take uh, both to protect yourself, but also the firefighters who are going to come and protect you. Um, and I think that's part of the, um, the, the play. Um, and because fire is fought at budget times, that's also a time to intercede. It seems to me that um, uh, fire, and, and we've just seen it in California, the state is throwing $500 million into fire suppression to buy more tools to suppress fires. Um, and, you know, okay, but how much is it putting, I mean, so that was basically half of the original um, uh, gesture on the part of the governor. 50% went to fire suppression, less than 4% went to education. Yeah, and I think that's, they're both. Yeah. That's, that's, that is not how you get to the answer that the questioner is asking. Yeah, and there, uh, Steve Pine uh, may be among them, but there have been calls for, let's, you know, let's retire Smokey Bear. Yeah. It, you know, it's been 75 years. I had a good run. He had let's, a really good run. Let's, let's send him out to the farm there, Sunnybrook Farm with uh, Sparky, the, our, our dog, and, you know. But really, you know, flippancy aside, it's the calls have been either retire him and his message, or you really need to completely overhaul the message. Right. But, yeah, you're, you're absolutely, you touched on what really needs to happen. It's a, a lot of hard work in, in, at different government levels, um, with the participation of different people. Uh, Craig Patterson mentions a um, Forest Service research forester named C.M. Country, sorry, C.M. Countryman, um, circa 1955 and into the 60s, argued that logging was the main cause of extreme wildfires, not suppression or climate change. And he has, he offers a some information that I guess countrymen had uh, generated. 
and so I, if, did I give you enough information there to comment or do you want me to uh, provide a little bit more? He did, um, say, he did say the cutting of old, old forests drastically modifies the fire climate and the opening of a virgin mixed, mixed conifer stand can increase the rate of fire spread up to four and a half times. Yeah, and I think one of the places where we have seen um, that problem flare up time and time again is Butte County uh, in the Sierra, where um, in 2008, there was a massive fire in response to that. The agencies, plural, federal, county, and state, uh, did a lot of logging. And then the campfire came in 2018. And then in 2020, there was another fire. Um, that burned through parts that had already burned, and that's not supposed to happen theoretically, but you're, you're producing um, grass and other sort of lower, lower tier um, growth that burned quite nicely uh, as fire goes, not great for the people who live there. Um, and so, you know, if in the 50s they're talking about logging as a key to um, transforming pretty rapidly, um, landscapes up. I'm going to go read Countrymen and, and sort of get a feel for, for that argument, but it's, it seems to me to be very um, uh, consistent. And again, um, we're seeing in, in Southern California also fires that are burning places that had burned far too recently for us theoretically to imagine them to burn again. But in fact, that's a, that's a process of conversion. Uh, Rick, Rick um, has, um, uh, what's Rick's name? I'm blanking on him at the Chaparral Institute, um, Halsey talks about this as well, that if you start burning Chaparral rap more rapidly and more intensely, you're gonna produce grass, which then creates all this, this erratic and, and very fast moving fires, which we've had in Claremont, um, grass fires that have just taken off like a shot um, and um, it pose lots of dilemmas. Mm. Uh, so we've been talking a little bit about education and Nancy Gibson says public education is critical as even small managed fire projects like prescribed burns are shut down by neighbors complaining before. Right. Um, today's federal efforts for light burning are still stymied within the uh, wildland urban interface. How can this be offset at both state and federal levels to support local needs for good fire? Um, that's why the, the pre, two previous uh, questioners ago, I think that's where the educational piece has to be. Um, that I get why, and you know, I live in Southern California, so like air pollution is an issue. I get why um, people are worried about prescribed fire and atmospheric carbon, for example, or escaped fires. Like, again, perfectly logical, uh, responses. Uh, but it's no less logical to argue that targeted prescribed fires managed well um, are going to produce lots of other benefits, um, not least of which is potentially reducing the capacity for wildfire to exist, an argument that the Forest Service and Greeley Graves and Leopold rejected back in the day, a hundred years ago. Um, but we know enough now to know that it is possible that this, this can produce those better ends as we imagine them at least. Um, and I think part of that is about education. Part of that is again, something that neighbor to neighbor can happen um, through the communities your, themselves, uh, you know, showing up at city council, council uh, county commissioners and the like, um, you know, they've, they've got a tough job and having people show up that are actually making the case for why we need to do the things we need to do. Um, is, is really critical. We can't do all of this top down. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and we've really got to figure out the bottom up message. And that may be, you know, toppling Smokey Bear. Um, it may be having Smokey Bear tell a different story. Uh, I don't care who it is, Woodsy Owl, bring Woodsy Owl back. Um, that, that we do need ways by which to better understand uh, the fire regimes that are happening. Um, and for me, at least, one of the ways to think about that is historically, like over time, how have these things emerged as they have? Um, but, but I also live in a place that burns. And so part of what I've got to do as a citizen is actually engaged as, as, as much as I possibly can uh, 
um, with those issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Leighton Quarles, uh, who's with the Forest Service out in the Southwest says, I'm thinking of Colonel John White and others at Sequoia National Park in the first official prescribed fire in California in the 1960s. And I'm wondering if White and the folks who worked there, both Park Service and Forest Service, had any known connection to indigenous fire practices, whether personally or through study? Um, I would say not. I would say that the predominant, I mean, I don't know. So quick answer is no. Um, but given the degree to which those agencies were insular and insula insulating, um, given the degree to which, especially the Park Service had no connection uh, with indigenous peoples as the history of Yosemite shows, as a national park at least, um, I, I would be surprised if those relationships existed. Um, much more likely is that they were paying attention to the Tall Timbers research work in the 1960s um, and that, um, you know, its notion that prescribed burning was paying off, as Robert Cooper wrote in 1962 or presented there, um, is taking that southeastern vision and trying to apply it in the 1970s. Um, you know, in the Gila National Forest, when lightning struck, the agency was deliberately slow in responding um, and, and sort of was beginning to adopt some of this language in, in that part of the Southwest. Um, and this sounds like the, the work that was taking place in the Sequoia um, <laughs> probably got a hell of a lot of pushback um, from the very same people that they are working with precisely because, um, you know, the, the language in, in California was, was not yet there. So I suspect that they were, again, I would have to know more about, about their experience, but Leighton, my guess is that they did not have that connection. Okay. And I think you, you may have answered a question that John Dennis had, had posed about the Everglades. And in fact, I want to thank hmm. uh, Leighton Quarles for in the, in the Q&A addressed John's question about uh, the influence of indigenous fire practices uh, in the in the Everglades. So, Leighton, thanks for for the question. And thanks for the answer. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I appreciate so many people have stayed on. So, I'm going to just go with two more questions, and uh, let's go with this one from an anonymous uh, contributor. What is? Oh, I hope I just didn't open the the can of worms on you. Know, but here we go. <laughs> what is the history behind the Forest Service's current stance on prescribed burns versus carbon sequestration? Right now, it looks like the Forest Service in Southern California is only interested in burning the carbon and selling wood instead of other management tools. In Southern California? That's... You mean like the Cleveland and San Bernardino and Angeles? They don't have any wood to sell. Uh, I, I guess I'm not sure. I mean, if Southern California means like, you know, Kern County and, and, and the like, um, um, I, I guess I'm puzzled by the question. All right. We will not count that against our score. Um, but can I answer David Nunez? Who? Yeah, absolutely. I, he and I were supposed to have a conversation at Pomona College because he's one of our grads. And um, I don't know, this thing called the microbe came flying through and shut us down. Um, the question is, are you aware of greater efforts to restrict rural development of fire prone areas now that the awareness of fire risks has increased, uh, i.e. the campfire? Um, the, the, the attempt in Lake County um, is the first time that the state has intervened and we'll see what happens with that. Um, there are certainly arguments that I and others have made about an extraordinarily, a 60,000 person development in Northern Los Angeles County, smack in the middle of what CAL FIRE calls a high severity fire zone. Uh, it's called Centennial. Um, you know, the developers have actually done a really good job of, you know, fire stations and all sorts of things, but it, it, 
it it boggles the mind that that the commissioner simply greenlit this without it. There's also Ote Mesa in eastern San Diego County, a massive place in an area that is burned every 18 months. Um, so, Dave, I would say that that um, <laughs> our record is not great on this one. Um, and, and yet it seems to me to be exactly the issue that we've got to face. Um, I mean, my sort of bumper sticker logic is build up, not out. Um, we need to create density. Um, and it seems to me in areas like Southern California where you've got valleys and, and mountains, um, you can do a lot in those valleys. And actually, you know, Los Angeles County is now not only the largest county in the country, it's the most dense which is not how people think about Los Angeles. Um, I'd like it to be denser and I'd like those foothills to be uh, a lot less dense. Um, so what, uh, ooh, there's so many good questions, it's very hard to choose. I, I apologize that we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, oh, Doug McCleary has some good ones. Let's end with Doug. I mean, okay. he's a fire guru. And, um, and, and Doug was a longtime Forest Service employee and, and uh, cards on the table. He's a current board member of the Forest History Society. So, <laughs> yes, so, so, you know, part of what um, clearly there's a private conversation going on between Doug and Steve Pine about light burners. And they were not just indigenous and they're right about this. What's really interesting to me um, and I didn't talk about it, but, but um, L.T. Bur Burcham, who was a Cal Forester, uh, the state forester um, in the 1960s, um, writes this piece about the sort of park, open parkness of much of California, which he does not attribute to indigenous fires. He said it was ranchers, miners, hunters, and the like that burned all of these places within a 20 year period. Uh, producing park-like experiences. What he does in so doing is to deny Indians a place in the past, let alone his present and our future. Um, so they're out of history and they're unworthy of consideration. Um, and so part of what this book is trying to do is to make that shift um, clear, but also to make the case that um, we, we need to both acknowledge that past as well as the contemporary world. But to get to Doug's point is, yes, ranchers were doing it. I mean, they were doing it in Southern Texas where I lived for many, many years, um, um, trying to burn, uh, to replicate um, conditions that were thought to have been there uh, when the Spanish first came in through in the 1760s. Uh, and the Spanish, despite their claims, the missionaries didn't like those fires, but ranchers certainly did because that's how they replicated grasslands, um, which is what the indigenous people had done for millennia in California and elsewhere. So, you know, we've, we, we have a lot of acknowledging to do and the we I'm talking about is those of us in a settler colonial world um, who come from that world. Um, and it, it seems to me that fire is a way to get at the issues um, that we need both to acknowledge and whose history um, we need to develop. So I will thank you so, so much to the many people who are on, the 112 people who are still on, pretty darn impressive. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for you guys for giving me so much time during your day.